Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, the Provost Alvarado for uh, allowing us to be here for the first time ever. Uh, I, don't, I think I believe this is the first time we have such an event in this campus. Um, and I'm very uh, honored by it, particularly because this religion comes from Cuba and from Africa. And most of us are from the Caribbean or from Spanish. Uh, colonies throughout Latin America, so it's very relevant to our culture. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Cristina Foster, uh, Danco, for uh, her efforts in getting us here, Dr. Rafael Martinez, and of course Ramon Sanchez, which I have the pleasure of uh, being invited by him on several occasions throughout the past few years now. Uh, to, to, as a guest speaker, to uh, present the uh, topics of our faith from different points of views in the classrooms, and I always find that to be very much fun for me. I don't know if it is for you all as students, but it is for me. Okay. First of all, I'd like to raise your hand very quickly. How many of you have ever heard of Santeria either through social networks or the media? How many have you even read about it in a book or something? That's, that's good. Okay. So everything you know about my religion is exactly what I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> uh, I'm going in a whole other different direction. You see, the reason why I do this is because the religion has been codified by social scientists uh, throughout history, from the outsider's lens, not being part of or integrated in our religious communities. And what they have done is that they have taken their Eurocentric theories to analyze that which is unknown to them. Therefore, what they've seen or witnessed and experienced in the African cultures and the different religious systems of the African based in Kula. What they did is basically absorb that, dismiss a whole bunch of, of information, reduce it to a theory that fits their Eurocentric, scholarly, Western perspective, and therefore have removed themselves from what in religious studies is called, or in philosophy is called, the is of their religion. All we have are pretty much ethnographic interpretations from the lens of the outsider to fit theories. So that's not what I'm going to do. That's academia's problem. As the uh, priest, I'm going to try to take a very complex issue, which is the role of women, in terms of gender and values. Two things. Two separate things. Western society tends to always look at this from one lens, which is gender. Well, African religions are not that way. They also consider, in fact, their starting point is gender values and not gender based. Right? So, uh, I want to try to get this very complicated presentation out to you. The best way I know how, uh, simplifying it as much as I can because it can get a little headsy. And I don't want to uh, confuse you too much. And then uh, the pasta equals and the guayabas and everything got back there and won't settle in the okay? So I'll try to be as light headed as possible. Um, my presentation will focus on the structural uh, manifestation of divine feminine values and nuclear beliefs and practices <laughs> as opposed to corporal feminine gender roles. Two different things important members. It is a rare topic that I believe merits deeper critical analysis from the perspective of psychology and philosophy. I know this is going to wake Ramon is that we always come in from the perspective of world religion and cultural anthropology. My short presentation is superficial, but I intend to familiarize you with substructural fundamentals of nuclear thought. 
the psychology of lupomy in terms of the dichotomy between corporal gender roles versus gender values and their relationships are understudied. I pose <clears throat> that in the absence of the divine feminine value, we deny the fundamental alchemy uh, nature of the religion. To decipher the nature of what constitutes the is of Rupa cannot be achieved from strict patriarchal perspectives of cultural, moral, ethical codes. The fundamentals of Rupali thought are binary and seeks to preserve the equilibrium of both gender values in terms of energy and corporal dynamics. The energetic aspects Priest of Shango, that happens, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that always happens. That music. <clears throat> the energetic aspects precede the corporal human body and mind. Lugami believes both are connected and influence each other. The first part of my presentation highlights the universal concept of Lugami core beliefs, which I call Lugami thought, differentiating it from Western philosophy in Abrahamic religions. Now I know that everything you read and hear about is syncretism, and um, it's Kuba, and it's Catholicism, and the Africans hid behind African saints and all that. <laughs> Not exactly. The second part of my presentation will focus on how the manifestation of the divine feminine values are present in religious practice. The Hermetic theory, as below, as above, is a concept of duality. The theory of duality is similar to the Lukumi division between our planet Earth representing the below portion and its connection to the above spiritual cosmic half. Therefore, the two halves constitute a binary theory. This you're not going to find in any book. In parallel to Lukumi thought, the Chinese yin yang theory of male and female values can be used, it can be useful background to comprehend the central unifying theme of Lukumi beliefs. The base of Chinese theory and Lukumi are both binary. Patriarchal societies tend to place emphasis on male gender looking outward. For example, features of the sage archetype are found in Jesus Christ, the Buddha, and prophets. They are the wise men. The female gender and values are distinctively curtailed. In comparison, the important distinction in that is that Lukumi does not emphasize gender. It centralizes its beliefs emanating outward from the perspective of value. This means there is a male and female value separate from each other as archetypes. Now, you're familiar with archetypes, right? Did you teach psychology here? Okay. See, Western scholars didn't come up with this idea of archetypes, the Yoruba, which precede. Western society already had figured out archetypes. But there can be a, com a compensation of male over female and female over male archetypes. Okay? Vice versa. It goes either way. God, the one substance, is called a locomotive, owner of everlasting abundance. Although Gumada resides somewhere in the infinite universe, the entire planetary system emanates from Gumada. Therefore, God represents an androgynous value. In Lupumi, God is not deified, a deified culture hero or incarnated incarnation in human flesh with human history. Although Gumada does not have human corporal features or distinctive one-sided gender. 
New belief does not have a concept of hell or death. When a Logumata's energy expands, male and female substances randomly scatter throughout the universe. Upon contact with each other, the interaction of male and female values merge and begin to create material forms resulting in the birth of all things. The, cos the cosmologic concept of divine values in Rukumi may be categorized in two parts. There are primal divinities called Orishas associated with the substances that created our planetary system and all life forms and secondary level of divinities that sustain the existence of all things on the planet. Divinities are organized by supernatural and natural domains. In the context of gender, there are male and female Orishas. That would be the apparent view, but a deeper analysis takes us to an androgynous value as the starting point. For example, the primal or archetype Odisha or Bhattara involves types that are male and female. There are many Obatala types. So when you read, or what you have read already, referencing these words, Obatala, that's an archetype. But there are many types. So the question always comes to mind, which Obatala are we speaking of? This is like saying the Sanchez family. Well, who are we talking about in the second family? Okay. I <laughs> However, when examining the Orisha archetype, for example, the Ogun Ochosi, Shango archetypes are all male gender and value types. Female gender archetypes and types such as Orisha's Yemaya and Hashum are feminine value. Orishas are organized by natural domains and have distinctive human characteristics associated with them. For example, Obatala archetype is associated with the sun, principle of light, silver, color of white, cold temperature, purity, endocrine plans, reason and logic, and wisdom. Yamaya, which means mother of fish, she represents the complexity of mother of mother figure. Her domain is the principle of absorption or contraction. Ocean, the moon, color blue, the womb, maternity and safety, nourishment, and vital body fluids. Oshun is associated with the river. Oshun is not the river. <laughs> I keep running into somehow, somewhere, crafting this idea that Oshun is the river, or the river is the river, or Oshun is the Oshun. Right. Uh, she's associated with grass, merriment, uh, feminine sensuality, not prostitution. <laughs> Sophistication, elegance, Emotions, blood, and fine arts. Shango is a male, and his domain corresponds to the principle of heat or fire. Expansions of energy, the ruler type, warrior, strategist, problem solving, male sensuality, lightning, and the color of red. He's the general male archetype of Osho. Tonight's dance, uh, Orisha dances, will uh, mimic the main characteristics of each Orisha while the music emulates the frequency and vibrational levels associated with each of the Orishas. Two separate things, all going at the same time in perfect harmony. So it's not just music. Divine manifestation in religious practice uh, begins with binary knowledge of nature. The calendar months begin with the new moon, which is the female value. 
Nighttime is the cooling period corresponding to Wu, a female value, and the color is dark or black. In contrast, the sun is associated with heat, a male value, and the color is light or white. Although the sun and moon consist of light, their manifestations result in a binary system. We have salt water and sweet water. Plants are binary. Some species are androgynous, while others are binary. Passive behavior and principle or principle of contraction is viewed in the point as a female value. Aggressive behavior or principle of expansion is viewed as a male value. There are examples of male values over female values and vice versa. There are binary examples where, the, where uh, male and female values work in harmony offsetting each other and not causing polarization. For example, positive and negative electrical wires, otherwise we don't have light. The structure of divination consists of 16 archetypes and 200 subtypes. The 256 in total divide into 128 male values and 100 28 female values. Each of the 256 possibilities follow the binary principles of Ide, meaning good fortune, and Osogo, meaning misfortune. Now this is, we te also teach business in this college, right? That's why I'm going to give that to you. Maslow's hierarchy of needs theory best categorizes the dynamics of the nation. Often, behavioral modifications are part of the holistic problem solving solution. There are circumstances where behavioral modification suffices and ritual or ceremony is not needed. Divination practitioners are male and female in the Bumi religion. However, most roles are occupied by women and gay priests. Priesthood ordination rites are fundamentally a female value. It is the act of rebirthing, even in circumstances when the birthing godparents gender is male. Orisha priesthood ordination is comprised mostly of female participants and less of names. May there uh, may be a correlation with the fact that women tend to be more religiously active. That's what we're going to figure out. <laughs> For example, in my practice uh, for more than 40 years, 90% uh, of, uh, of the people that come to seeking my assistance are women. Uh, they're seeking guidance, just in general. And usually they're being concerned with what? Matters of the home, parents, siblings, uh, shelter, right? Go to mass, you know, sort of stuff. So in conclusion, what I'd like to uh, present today is the proposal that historical accounts present compelling evidence recognizing women in the majority as progenitors of the Lukumi religion and colonial organizations in Kuala. In the United States, the first Lukumi church was founded by my mother, Carmen Blas Rodriguez, a priestess of the Iraq. And with the guidance of her central spiritual guide, Encarnacion de la Calidad de Rodriguez, a former slave and priestess of Ochum in her lifetime. Compelling evidence demonstrates that the central essence of Lukumi in the context of supernatural and natural is binary and emanates from the feminine value, not the male. After all, we say Mother Earth. Without the feminine, there would be there would not be life and evolution.
Thank you. Here, Dr. Rafael Martinez, and of course Ramon Sanchez, which I have the pleasure of uh, being invited by him on several occasions throughout the past few years now uh, to, to, as a guest speaker, to uh, present the uh, topics of our faith from different points of views in the classrooms. And I always find that to be very much fun for me. I don't know if it is for you all, it's true, but it is for me. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to raise your hand very quickly. How many of you have ever heard of Santeria either through social networks or the media? That's a good number. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, Provost Alvarado for uh, allowing us to be here for the first time ever. Uh, I, don't, I, think, I believe this is the first time we have such an event in this campus. Uh, and I'm very uh, honored by it, particularly because this religion comes from Cuba and from Africa, and most of us are from the Caribbean or from Spanish uh, uh, colonies throughout Latin America, so it's very relevant to our culture. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Cristina Foster, uh, Campo, for uh, her effort to analyze that which is unknown to them. Therefore, what they've seen or witnessed and experienced in the African cultures and the different religious systems of uh, African based in Cuba, what they did is basically absorb that, dismiss a whole bunch of, of information, reduce it to a theory that fits their Eurocentric, scholarly, Western perspective, and therefore have removed themselves from what in religious studies is called, or in philosophy is called, the is of their religion. All we have are, how many have you even read about them? In a book or something. That's, that's good. Okay. So everything you know about my religion is exactly what I'm not going to tell you. Uh, I'm going in a whole other different direction. You see, the reason why I do this is because the religion has been codified by social scientists uh, throughout history from the outsider's lens, not being part of or integrated in our religious communities. And what they have done is that they have taken their Eurocentric theories pretty much ethnographic interpretations from the lens of the outsider to fit theories. So that's not what I'm going to do. That's academia's problem. As the uh, priest, I'm going to try to take a very complex issue, which is the role of women, in terms of gender and values. Two things, two separate things. Western society tends to always look at this from one lens, which is gender based. Well, African religions are not that way. They also consider, in fact, their starting point is gender values. 